The following video is intended for training purposes only. Congratulations! You have made the most important decision of your life and become a hell diver. You'll be defending democracy in no time. Haha! <laughs> but first, there are a few things you need to learn. Please freely give your undivided attention to the head of the Helldiver Science Division, Kyle Hill. Attention is mandatory. Helldivers, welcome. If you're watching this video, it means you're currently en route to dispense democracy to all corners of the galaxy. What you're fighting for is that beautiful lady right there, Super Earth. But don't let the name fool you. Part 1 For Super Earth. Our home is certainly super because of its incredibly loyal citizens and our supervised freedoms, but it's not super in the way that astronomers would use that term. Technically, a super planet is any planet that resembles its namesake but is larger. What NASA would call a super Earth, for example, would be a planet similar to Earth that is between 2 and 10 times its mass. This symbol here is shorthand for the mass of Earth and will be used on your exam. Increased mass means increased gravity. <laughs> Not great for erecting statues of our greatest democratically elected leaders, or for that bathroom scale. <laughs> Currently, there have been 1,691 super-Earths discovered across the universe, but only one that we call home. <laughs> 69. Nice. Of course, we wouldn't even be able to stretch the firm hand of patriotism across the Milky Way without a way to transport our citizens to other worlds. This is where faster-than-light travel comes in. Heroically liberated from the mysterious and low-resolution illuminates, this technology's closest analog is the Alcubierre drive, a so-called warp device that gets around pesky time dilation effects by compressing space-time in front of a destroyer and expanding the space-time behind it. In effect, moving space through you instead of moving you through space. Helldiver FTL drives run on a steady supply of the liquid known as E710, which, thank liberty, contains the exotic matter necessary to bend space-time and can be found in decomposing terminant bodies. If you'd like to know more, please reference this additional video featuring an interview with Dr. Alcubierre himself, found in your Freedom folder. Now I know what some of the more studious Helldivers among you might be thinking right now. But Professor Dr. Sergeant Kyle, sir, if we have faster than light travel, why don't we just use that in Einstein's theory of relativity to create closed time-like curves and go back in time before the Terminids even had an outbreak in the first place? <laughs> why don't you let us here at the Science Division handle questions like that? You just focus on firing the taxpayers' projectiles. Further questions will be met with, uh, harsh reprimand. Part 2. Hell Diving. I know you're raring to go out there and administer some managed democracy, champ, but before you do, you have to know about the diving in hell diving. When you arrive to a planet in need of liberation, your destroyer will be in a low orbit. But that's still surprisingly high. The International Space Station, for example, is in a low orbit of 400 kilometers above sea level, moving with a tangential velocity of over 7 kilometers per second, or 17,000 miles per hour. At this incredible velocity, astronauts can witness up to 16 gloriously fiscally conservative sunrises a day. Mach 25 is quite the liber speed, Helldiver. It's so fast that anything re-entering an atmosphere will impact air molecules too quickly for them to move out of the way. This heats up the air until it breaks down into another state of matter, plasma, creating one hell of a light show. That's what you will see on your first dive. Adiabatically heated rarefied atmospheric plasma that transfers heat to your pod via convection. <laughs> Say that ten times fast. <laughs> However, though you will hear robot ladies over the intercom saying the opposite, your destroyer will not in fact be in orbit around an occupied planet, like the International Space Station is around Earth. You can see that the planet is not turning beneath your feet, Helldiver, and it's too close to be in a geostationary orbit, which would explain why it's not turning. In reality, your destroyer will be hovering above your mission objective in order to provide artificial gravity to the ship. It's a costly way to generate gravity, but a useful one. Consider this, there is still almost 90% of the gravity of Earth 
on the ISS. Astronauts are only weightless there because they are falling around the planet. If the station suddenly stopped and hovered, those astronauts would be standing at attention, just like you are now. Now, I know what some of the more studious among you might be thinking right now, but Detective Private with Eyes Kyle, if we're not actually in orbit around a planet, why is there compression heating on our hell pods when we drop into the atmosphere? <laughs> you ask a lot of questions, don't you? You know, questions can be thought crime. Yes, I know many of you out there have heard the stories, but the figure that 52% of hell divers die upon hell pod impact has been greatly exaggerated and is undemocratic. Thanks to our loyal engineers, G-forces have been reduced to the point that now only 49% of hell divers valiantly compress their spines for the cause. Don't believe unsanctioned propaganda. Part 3. The Enemy Terminates. Simultaneously the source of our FTL fuel and one of the greatest threats to democracy. Like spiders on Super Earth, terminids have an exoskeleton and move by pressurizing their limbs with precious E710. Because this fluid acts as a hydraulic fluid, as hemolymph does in arachnids, hydrostatic pressure in the body of terminids increases when they are running, jumping, and otherwise threatening our way of life. That's why they tend to pop when they get destroyed. They are pressurized, just like evil balloons. Eh, <laughs> take that, bug boy. While Helldiver armor does provide legally adequate defense against most forms of damage, your biggest danger on the bug battlefield will be Terminid Bio. Its closest analog on Super Earth is the defense mechanism of the Bombardier Beetle. This beetle combines chemicals in its abdomen in an exothermic reaction that explodes the resultant mixture out into the eyes of its enemies. These tiny little freedom haters can and do cause serious damage to their targets with literally boiling butt brew. Isn't evolution amazing? Only when it serves democracy. Much less is known about another great threat to Super Earth. The socialist, probably, automatons. We don't know much, but what we do know is that they like to have their projectiles contain a powder, a finely ground magnesium, strontium, and organic fuel. This creates that bright red streaking effect that is so characteristic of red tracer rounds back home on Super Earth. Why exactly they use this ammunition is unclear. Maybe they're communist. <laughs> I'm just joking. Or am I? <laughs> no, I'm joking. The term communist is outlawed. You know that. We all know that. Part 4. Your Weapons Now, as much as I'd love to tell you that Helldivers and their standard-issue firearms are enough to repel any evildoer, the truth is that you're going to need some help from above, in the form of various orbital strikes. Now, before democracy reached its invisible hand outside the solar system, an orbital strike meant something very different. The power of an orbital strike came not from lasers or nukes, but from velocity. If a destroyer or a weapon platform is in an orbit around a planet, that means it's already going thousands of miles per hour. Anything dropped from that orbit, therefore, will have a tremendous amount of energy from its motion alone. Kinetic energy then can take the place of chemical and or nuclear energy. This simple and cost-effective perspective is where the rods from God weapon concept comes from. Just imagine an 8,000 kilogram tungsten cylinder impacting the battlefield at Mach 10 from space. That's an energy equivalent to 11,000 kilograms of TNT. <laughs> Glorious. Now I know what some of the more studious among you might be thinking right now. But Dr. Professor Sergeant Professor Kyle, sir, if our ships aren't actually in orbit, why do we call them orbital strikes? <laughs> well, the final line of defense when liberating a planet in need is the 500 kilogram bomb, able to take out all but the most socially liberal of targets in a single massive explosion. 500 kilograms of what, you ask? <laughs> well, it's not TNT. The fireworks that you'll see after calling in this orbital strike are much larger than 500 kilograms of TNT could produce. And it's not 500 kilograms of fissionable material. 
Not even the most stimmed up Helldiver could escape a nuclear weapon with that much explosive material. So what is it? Well, it's <laughs> just kidding. That information is hella classified. Helldivers, I'm not gonna sugarcoat things for you. Serving up a piping hot cup of liberty to Super Earth's many enemies, yum yum, is not gonna be easy. Most of you will not be returning home. That's a risk that the taxpayers just decided you're willing to take. But if you stay vigilant, stay smart, and above all, stay free in a ceremonial sense, you will return home a legend. Thanks for watching. <laughs> oh, and Helldiver, remember, it can't be fascism if no one's allowed to say that it is. Good luck out there. Now exiting the facility. Thank you so much to the very nerdy staff here at the facility for the direct and substantial support in the creation of this here video. If you want to join the facility, if you want to drape on an aforementioned silky white lab coat, you want videos early, and you want to join our private members only discord, that's patreon.com slash kylehill to join today. And hey, if you support us just enough, you get your name on Aria here in every single video. Lucky you! There's so many of you. How could I possibly pass the time to do the after credits thing that I'm doing off the top of my head. The problem with lasers through the atmosphere, like you see in Helldivers, is that lasers are very quickly attenuated by stuff in between them. Laser weapons can even be rendered ineffective by fog and smoke. So by having them go through an entire atmosphere, you would need giant lasers with a lot of electricity. It doesn't work as good as just kinetic bombardment, where lasers would do a lot of work in a battle would be in space where there's nothing to get between a target and what's shooting that laser. And lasers move at the speed of light and they would stay. What I'm saying is fight the bugs in space. Make them come to you. Don't go to them. They smell, probably. <laughs>